Well, good evening. My name is Ken. I'm one of the pastors here at Southside Bible Church, and I just want to personally welcome you to our Christmas Eve service. This is our 23rd Christmas Eve service since we started Southside Bible Church. One of my favorite nights of the year. I just love uh, Christmas Eve. So here's what I like to do on Christmas Eve. I like to preach a little shorter than normal. Uh, the good news is, is many of you have other plans and things to do. The bad news is the normal is usually very long. So, so what I want to do on Christmas Eve is to give you the best Christmas possible every year by helping you understand what is it that we are celebrating. To help boil it down to the very essence of the incarnation, God himself coming into this world as a baby. To bless you with this truth, I want to give you the meaning of why did a baby come in, uh, into a manger who created the world. And so what, what I uh, seek to do is to help you understand then what we are celebrating. Many miss the first Christmas as we just heard, and many will miss it this year as well, and I, I don't want that to happen to anybody uh, here tonight. And so I'm going to preach uh, one verse uh, that can give you the true meaning of Christmas in five words, four in the Greek. So my title tonight is The Four Words of Christmas. And so let's look at God's explanation of the birth of Jesus into the world that we live in uh, this night. Let's pray and we will open up the Word of God. Father, I thank you for this uh, beautiful service. Thank you for those sweet hearts that just led us to the throne of grace. We're grateful for them, grateful for why we worship, for the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray now that you will meet us and help everyone in this room to understand clearly why Jesus Christ came into this world. Let, let no one walk out confused or not understanding this. By your Spirit, uh, open eyes and let every mind see, eyes see and minds understand. Please meet us here in power and do what no human being can do. I pray, Holy Spirit, do your work. Amen. Turn with me to John chapter 1. If you look up on the screen, we're just going to be looking at this verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And what I love about this verse, well, one of the things is that Christmas has become to many in the world a, a story about Joseph and Mary a manger scene and angels and wise men and shepherds and stars. And those are all a part of this beautiful picture that God paints for us in Scripture of the birth of Jesus Christ. But those tell us uh, what happened that blessed Christmas morn, but it, it doesn't tell us what is the, the significance of what took place. And John, of all the gospel writers, there's four gospels, John just skips all the details and he just gives us verse 14, that's it. And so my question tonight is, what if there's no stable or angels or shepherds or Joseph or Mary for that matter? What would we have? Well, we would have John's account of the birth of Jesus. And John doesn't give us anything that in the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Matthew, two chapters. Luke, two chapters to describe the birth. Mark, close to one. And John, we get this. The Word became flesh. Yet this is probably the most comprehensive meaning of Christmas in the Bible. So let's look at it. Let's unpack these four words and see what God would have for us tonight. Uh, this will be the best package you're going to unwrap all of Christmas, I guarantee it. There's never been a gift so humbly wrapped with such infinite preciousness. Let's take a look. Verse 14, and the word. It just seems like a strange name when you first read. Why, why didn't John just say Jesus? Why? And the word. Well, the Greek word is, is logos, and this word is loaded with meaning. In fact, it's used three times in this one verse, um, in verse 1, I'm sorry. And that is why John doesn't give any more explanation in verse 14, because he's already explained it in verses 1 through 4. He, he's introduced it really in these first 13 verses of chapter 1. And so let's try to get our arms around this word, because I think it's the key to Christmas, logos. The Greeks of the time, the philosophers and all the peoples surrounding the area, Logos was a, a title that was given to the creative force. It, it was the ordering mind that created the universe, an intelligent design. They, they saw balance and order to the universe, and they concluded there has to be a power 
behind all of this, but we can't know it. And so they called it Logos. And it was, it was very impersonal, but, but our calling as humans then was to know Logos and kind of align yourself with it, and then all of your life would go well. And the problem was trying to figure out Logos. The Stoics would say, the Logos is you just got to accept suffering. It's a part of life. Grit your teeth and bear it. The Epicureans of the day said, you got to live to make the world a better place. Find what makes you happy. And so it was just an endless pursuit of trying to find Logos in your life. And it's what goes on in our world every day, people trying to find Logos. Then you come to the Jews, the, the people of God in that day. And for them, it was a very familiar word. In the Old Testament, the, they would say the word of the Lord, and that was this word. It was God saying, here's, here's uh, him revealing himself. And Moses, he gave him the, the law, this expression. It was the disclosure of God uh, through logos that we see in the Old Testament. And so John tells us some amazing things about logos. And I want you to uh, look at verses 1 through 3, if you could put that up on the screen. <clears throat> John 1, 1 through 3, in the beginning, John begins, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. And so John kind of reveals three things about Logos. First, Logos, Jesus, preexisted. In the beginning, was the Word, and the Word was with God. In Genesis 1-1, when the Bible began, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And now John's coming, and when Jesus comes to the world, he's taking that up. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the original beginning of history, when everything that existed in this universe, when it came into being, Jesus already existed. So when everything was created, Jesus was there. He existed before time. He existed eternally. Jesus existed before his birth. He existed before the creation of the world. Do you realize what this is saying? The infinite majesty of this God-man that was born in Bethlehem's manger existed before the creation of the world. He's always been. It's overwhelming. In the beginning was the word. And it's in, the, in this tense in the Greek that means a continuous existence. When the beginning began, he was. He was before all things. And also it says that he was with God. When the beginning began, the word, already existing with God, the Father, he was with him. He was not a competitor. <clears throat> Prostheos means face to face, communion between the Father and the Son. And in the, in the Proverbs, it says that you were daily my delight, talking of the Father and the Son's relationship. So Jesus pre-exists in a perfect fellowship and relationship with God the Father in this blessed bond, the oneness of fellowship. In John 17, Jesus prayed, restore to me the glory which we had with you, I had with you before the foundation of the world. And the Father, when Jesus was baptized, he says, this is my beloved son, not a competitor, not lesser. He existed in an intimate, personal communion with the Father. Before time, he was the eternal God. And he also had a coexistence and a quality. It says the word was God. He was distinct from the Father. Yet he was fully God as the Father was. The word was God. And so I want you to see that he existed before eternity passed. He was with the Father, and the Word was God. He was deity. And then self-existence in verses 2 through 3, in him was life. Life was in him. He did not receive life from another source as everything created did. He possesses it all by his nature, and he gives life, and he gave life to everything that has life. And he's come into the world to give eternal life. And John, when he writes his first epistle, he says, and we have seen and testified to you the eternal life, that Jesus gives eternal life. And so I want you to let this sink in. John stands and declares to the Jews and the Greeks, the Logos is not some source of design. It's not a bunch of principles and rules from Moses, but it's a person 
who was in the beginning with God, and he was God, and he gave life to all things. He's the revelation of God. He's the revelation of his glory. And John says, this one became flesh and dwelt among us. The one born in a manger and laid in a feeding trough, that baby was the pre-existent, co-existent, self-existent God who made all things. The infinite one was wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying in a manger. I'm going to read to you from Hebrews. Hebrews 1.1, God, after he spoke long ago in the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, our Old Testament, in these last days he's spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory. Jesus is the radiance of the Father's glory in the exact representation of his nature, and he upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, <clears throat> he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than the, the name Logos, Lord of all. And so our second point then, he preexisted, and I want you to see then that the word became flesh, gnosko. In the fullness of time, the whole Bible has been painting this story and unfolding this promise and showing typological connections. Just the whole thing has been telling us that the Son of God would come into the world to save it. The word was incarnated into the world in the form of a man. The angel told Mary, the Holy Spirit will overpower you, and you're going to have a holy embryo inside of you who's fully God and fully man. And it's so beautiful because the Word is God and His entry into this world. The, the, the infinite one that we just looked at took coming and taking on a finite body. He came to the earth He created, being fully God and fully man. Humanity and deity dwelling together in one body. That's why Wesley said, hark the herald angels sing. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. Pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. God is with us, the word became flesh. And while this is stunning and breathtaking and has much mystery in it, what I want you to ask in your seat tonight is why? Why does the creator, God, eternality enter into this world in the form of a baby. Why would God do this? Why would he enter a world of fallenness and brokenness? It's so broken and messy, it hated him, it rejected him, it falsely accused him all of his days, and they hung him up on a cross at the finish? Why would he enter in? I heard an illustration this week that helped me get at it just a little bit. In 1964 in Queens, true story, there was a lady named Kathy Genevieve, and she was assaulted and murdered right outside of her apartment building. And it brought great distress to the world as it was reported because she screamed and yelled and cried for help. Lights in the building were flipped on, and no one ever helped and no one ever called the police. And the reporter found someone who lived in the building and interviewed them and said, why did you not help? I didn't want to get involved. I, I, I could have got killed if I came down. If I called it in, the lead could have come back to me and I could have been killed. Being involved makes you vulnerable. And Christmas is God getting involved and leaving glory to come in this earth to rescue sinners from the peril of, of eternal death. He took on flesh and became vulnerable to where he could be crucified on a cross on our behalf for our sin. Christmas is Jesus, whose God saw our plight. He came down and he entered the world of our pain and sin and futility to do something amazing. And it makes him so personal. You get joined to him and you figure out logos. You figure out the order of the world and what it works for and how it works and why and what God is doing in this world. It's not a set of rules, but it's a personal saving God. 
You should call him Jesus because it's he that will save his people from their sins. Well, why? <clears throat> the word became flesh and he dwelt among us. And this is so important. He's not just a spirit. He's not just a moral teacher, a phantom, a mental experience, an illusion like, like we give to Santa Claus. But this is God who took on humanity and it says he dwelt among us. And the Greek word is tabernacled. He tabernacled among us. And I think John chose this word very carefully because it's so rich in Old Testament meaning and all the Jews would have known exactly what it meant. The tabernacle was the design that was given to Moses when he delivered Israel out of the bondage to Egypt. And it was the place where they would come and they would worship him. And you had the, the Gentiles in the outer court and the Jews would come into the inner court. And then there was this veil that separated it the, uh, to go into the Holy of Holies where God's glory dwelt. They called it the most holy place. <clears throat> and there was a veil <clears throat> that separated God's glory then from both Jew and Gentile. They couldn't come in. No one could enter into his presence without being consumed. The high priest once a year would go make atonement from a sacrifice from a bull and goat and, and pour it over the mercy seat and get out. This was the problem since the creation. When God created man and woman and they sinned and the fall came into this world. Adam was walking with God. God comes in the garden and now Adam's hiding from God because of who God is and because of who we are. There's this infinite chasm between God and man now that, that cannot come back together. And God put an angel over the Garden of Eden and it said it was a sword and it moved in every direction to show that no one can come back into the presence of God without the sword of justice being satisfied. And so the presence of God to the Jew was awesome and most dangerous. He wasn't a big guy in the sky or my co-pilot. This is the history of the world for thousands of years. Exodus 19 and 20, when God gave the law to Moses, he came down on Mount Sinai and he said, don't even touch the mountain or you will die. Moses said, show me your glory. And God says, if I show you my glory, you will die. The problem for the Greek, Logos, was to connect with the design and flow of the universe and the problem for the Jew was to get right with the Creator through keeping laws and being a good person. We can't get connected with this God and His purpose that He has for the universe and those means. So the Logos became flesh and tabernacled among us. He took on a body and He had the fullness of the deity dwelling within that body. And John says, we saw and we beheld His glory. Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. We saw the glory of God tabernacled uh, in a body, a human body with deity dwelling in the Holy of Holies now dwelling in that tabernacle. How? How can we dwell with God in his glory and not be consumed? That's been the question for all of history. And we're told now as he tabernacled, he was full of grace and truth. Look at John 1.16 if you have your Bibles. For out of his fullness we've all received grace upon grace, layers and layers of grace in this one that tabernacled among men. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth were realized through Jesus. The grace of God is that he sent his son into this world. The Logos became flesh to bring men and God back together into a love relationship like Adam had in the garden. It's, it's what you've been looking for your whole life, trying to find this home. And, and so, so he goes under the sword. Jesus goes up on a cross for that sword of justice for our sin. And, the, and the, the innocent one became guilty of every sin that we ever committed, and the Father pierced him through for our transgressions. And the veil to the presence of God was torn in two. You couldn't go in there. And God tears it in two to say, now you can come back into my presence through Jesus Christ and what he has done. Full, free access to the glory of God where we would have been consumed before. Jude said we can stand in his presence blameless with great joy now because of Jesus Christ and what he's done. <clears throat> this body that he took on 
was so that it could be pierced through for your transgressions. That's why he took on a body, to satisfy the justice of God for your sin, so that now you can come into his presence and dwell with him. The glory of God was the most traumatic thing through the whole Old Testament. And now the one writing these words is laying at the bosom of Jesus Christ, saying the disciple whom Jesus loved. He's, he's beholding the glory of God in relationship. How does that happen? That's what the gospel does. That's why he was incarnated and came into the world, to bring men and women back to God. God is not some rules to be followed like the Jews thought, but to be beheld. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is why the word became flesh and tabernacled among us so that we could behold his glory and not be consumed. As we just uh, will sing here, we can come and behold him. And we can come and adore him, Christ the King. And we can... We, jo John, I'm going to go back. I skipped it, but I want to come back to it because I love this verse. Listen to what John said. You know what? I'm going to skip it because I can't find it. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. I found it. First John, I want you to listen to the apostle who's writing this. What was from the beginning, here we are again, what we've heard and what we've seen with our eyes what we beheld and our hands handled concerning the Logos of life. And the life was manifested, Jesus. And we've seen and bear witness and proclaim to you the eternal life in him, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also that, that you also may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowships with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ, and these things we write so that our joy may be made complete. You can have fellowship with God because of what he beheld and touched, the one who tabernacled among us, the word, the logos that became flesh and, and brought about a, a gospel and a salvation for sinners. And so as we close out, two responses to what I just shared. I want you to listen to John 1, 12. I'm going to start actually in verse 11. Jesus came to his own, which would have been the Jewish people. And those who were his own didn't receive him. They'd been promising him for thousands of years, and they rejected him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. And so the ones who will receive this Christ who's come into the world to save sinners among who I am foremost, he says, you'll become children of God. You'll be brought so close that you're now in the family and adopted, and you can be a child of God, and you can put your head at the bosom of Christ like the Apostle John. He came to offer that to all peoples. Will you receive him? Or will you keep coming up with reasons why you want to reject him? trying to figure out your own logos of how the world works and what's going to bring everything together. Maybe trying to keep all the rules, whatever it is. I want to ask you tonight, will you receive him? Because this is a Christ who must be received. And I was thinking on this. If you go to the White House and if you can get as close to the door and knock on it and say, I'm here to see the president, they'd say, no way. And then if you run after him, they're going to shoot you. But if you're the child of the president, you walk into his room at night and say, Daddy, I'm thirsty. Children of God have full access to the glory of God. That's why Jesus came into the world. Full access to bring you back into the presence of God. And, the, and here's the other option. In John 1, 5, the light, Jesus, shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. They, they didn't get it. They, they look at what I just said and they say, what's for dinner? I want to go get drunk. And it means nothing. They, they, couldn't, they couldn't get what I just went over that's so beautiful. There came a man sent from God whose name was John the Baptist. And he came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. But he was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. 
And there was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. And he was in the world, and the world was made through him. And the world didn't know him. The creator God enters into what he created, and the world didn't know him. And he came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. And this is why you can't get in touch with the logos, the order and structure of this world. It's why you just keep, everything keeps breaking. Solomon said it's like chasing after the wind. Everything you think that's going to finally satisfy you, the relationship, the money, the trip, you just keep coming up empty and saying, I can't figure out this life. I can't seem to make it work. Maybe I'll go to Southside Bible Church tonight, get my in-laws off of my back. And you just keep pushing Jesus away. And the Logos, Jesus, came to make you right with your creator in this void. You'll never, you were made for him and you'll never be right till you're right with him. To walk in his purposes and design for human beings to love God and love others. Or he came to his own, the Jews who were religious. And you might be here tonight and you're, you're very religious. You've got your legalism and you do all the right things. You try to be the best person you can be. You go to church. You're always trying to be the best version of you and you're sitting here tonight going, it left me empty. His glory would just burn up all those good works tonight. Isaiah said, your righteous acts are like a filthy rag before this word, this holy God, who he is. And so tonight, the call is to quit looking to your works and your religion to quit looking to trying to figure out this world with some key that you're going to finally get life working for you and to receive the Logos who was there in eternity past and he was God and he was with God and he entered this world and he tabernacled among us so that we could come into the very presence of the glory of God and behold his glory. And so I, I pray. Christmas is the answer. This one eternal, coexistent, and fleshed God lying in a manger came to bring us back home with God in a love relationship and communion and safety. And he took on a body to go up on a cross and die in our place for our sins. They had that justice had to be satisfied. And then he took on flesh and he had to live 33 years of living righteousness under the law to fulfill it. So that now in him, God will treat us as if we live the life Jesus lived. So here's the gospel. God will treat Jesus as if he lived the life you lived. And he'll put him up on a cross and he'll pour out his full wrath on the Son of God on a cross. And he'll treat you as if you lived the life that Jesus lived. He'll look at you and, and smile and say, there's a righteousness. You have a perfect righteousness put to your account. That is Christ. Will you receive him? Or do you not comprehend them? And everything else is big and Jesus is little. Here is Christ. There is Christmas without mangers and shepherds and angels. There's Christmas without Santa and presents and eggnog. Lots will celebrate this scene tonight. But have you received the King of glory, the Lord Jesus Christ, and been born again and been saved? John closes out this gospel and he says, I write all these things of Jesus' life so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Receive the gift of God tonight. I'll be available after the service with some other of the elders and leaders of this church. And I just ask that you would be reconciled to God. God and sinner reconciled. So now you can be in the presence of God and not be consumed but you can worship and stand in his presence, blameless with great joy. That is the offer of Jesus Christ. That's why the word became flesh. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this glorious gospel. I thank you for the word. Lord, I thank you that he was with God and he was God. God, I thank you for the eternal one that he left glory. And he did take on the form of a babe, born into this world, come and live the life we should have and die the death we deserved. God, I thank you that he tabernacled. And now we can, he can bring us into the very presence of God, forgiven for all our sins, wrapped in his righteousness, and now adopted and accepted. We can put our head at the bosom 
of Christ and be safe. Oh God, what a gospel. I pray there'd be none in here who would ever try to stand in your presence without that. God, let them see tonight and let them receive Jesus Christ and be children of God. And it's in his precious name that we do pray. Amen. Merry Christmas. Love you all.